All right. <clears throat> so we have no quiz scheduled this week in lecture. If you look at the syllabus, um, we're in week 11. Um, next week, the 15th, we do have our seventh lecture quiz scheduled and um, I will send an email out to you with respect to like what to look at or be responsible for for that that quiz. I wanted to kind of get a sense of where you guys are in terms of the lecture uh, recorded lectures and the PowerPoints and so forth. Um, so this week, <clears throat> we're scheduled to wrap up chapter 11. I'll and, be Patty. And begin chapter 12. According again to the schedule, which is what I'm trying to adhere to. Um, I just recorded and posted last night or yesterday late afternoon the first of what will be probably three or four Zoom lectures for chapter 12. So you see the first there now if you go and look. So, so that's kind of where we are in terms of the semester, the chapters and that kind of thing. So just open it up for questions related to any of the chapters that you'd like to talk about. You're being stupid. Okay, knock it off, both of you. No one's being stupid. I can type for you. There's no reason for me to have to get up. I'll let you know what she said. Any questions on stuff we've been talking about? I did think I, I indicated to you that I had posted um, for chapter 11, uh, a Zoom lecture basically that was done by a different individual other than me. But uh, as I watched it, and I, I used him a little bit last spring, um, even though it's from, I think, an earlier edition, he may be using the 10th edition of your textbook. It was virtually the same stuff that I would have uh, lectured on. And I think of all the chapters, <clears throat> chapter 11 is one that while it's full of information, um, I don't think of it as having a lot of real technical stuff in it, if you will. Unlike, say, the biochemistry, where we were you know, talking about ATP synthesis and the hydrolysis of glucose and all that sort of stuff. I, I just don't find chapter 11 to be really very hard to read. I think it's very logically laid out. And so I thought it would lend itself well uh, to that particular format. But Again, I'm not sure where, where you guys are in terms of your your studies. Have you have you gotten into eleven yet? Are you still back in nine, ten? Well, we had nine on the test, didn't we? So you're done with nine. Oh, ten. There's a couple of comments about ten. Ten is the uh, genetic engineering chapter. Um, I had posted what I thought was. Um, a Zoom recording from last spring that I did on chapter uh, 11 or 10. And um, Elizabeth emailed me and said, hey, it's not working right. So I went back in yesterday and I don't know what the heck happened, but I was able to fix it. So if you were having difficulty accessing the Zoom lecture for 10 up until yesterday, um, it should be repaired now. It's about a remember how long that Zoom lecture is. It's a, it's a much shorter lecture. I think it's like a 42 minute lecture, something like that. Because I bounced around a bit in chapter 10. This chapter, while not terribly long, is terribly technical. It's probably the shortest chapter in the whole book as I look at it here. Um, you know, it's literally less than, than about 25 pages. So I mean, that's from, from front, front to back. But um, I, I bounced around a little bit. I omitted some major sections because I just didn't feel you needed to know a lot about the polymerase chain reaction. This is really higher level molecular biology. It's not something you need to know if you're going into nursing. Um, 
So, so therefore, as you look at the chapter, you're going to find it probably best to, to watch the, the Zoom lecture and then just find those corresponding chapters uh, or pages rather in that chapter and, and, and read those, reference those. Okay, so Carolina just had a chat here real quick. Um, she's finished chapter 10, <clears throat> have not gotten to 11. Is there something we need to mainly focus on? <clears throat> well, again, chapter 11 uh, covers a wide variety of topics and they focus primarily on um, physical, chemical and mechanical agents of control. How do you control microorganisms? Uh, so for example, physical agents would be things like um, the autoclave, um, incineration of microbes on an inoculating loop, you know, physical heat, radiation, those are physical agents that you can use to control, uh, i.e. kill or lower the number of microorganisms. Chemical agents get at things like um, Oh, the use of, of disinfectants and antiseptics. Anyway, there's a flow chart there in the first part of the chapter that kind of lays it out. And then what I do for the for this lecture is I break it down. I start with the physical agents and then we talk about those um, or, or he does, I should say. And then he co covers the chemical and the mechanical. It just, it just goes down the line, down those that flow chart in some respects is really what it is. So there's nothing in particular to focus on. I think you need to be aware of the diversity of different physical and chemical and um, mechanical control mechanisms. Um, so I, I, you got to get into it, I think. Has anybody started looking at chapter 11 yet? I've started looking at it, but should we know like the specific chemical agents and stuff like that? Let's pull up the PowerPoint. Okay, so do you see that on your screen? Yeah. Okay. So as I said a minute ago, the the PowerPoint is a survey of these three major methodologies. Um, now you were asking about chemical agents, so we can we can jump right down to that right off the bat if you want to do that rather than go through all these other ones. So here's that section that focuses on chemical agents. And so it talks about you know, desirable characteristics when it comes to uh, invention, if you will, of disinfectants or antiseptics or any sort of a chemical that we might use to control microbial growth. Uh, we define some terms here. Anytime, anytime you see I-C-I-D-E, that's usually meaning death of. Um, and then we define the different levels of germicidal activity, high, medium, and low. Um, again, I think this is this is very straightforward and to the point. So what I think you were asking was, what do we need to know with regard to specific names of chemicals? And so what I did with this slide is I tried to highlight or star those particular agents that I felt the PowerPoint spend a little more time talking about, which of course is the majority of these granted. Um, what I didn't spend much time on and what I don't think you need to really worry so much about would be, you know, for example, the quaternary ammonium compounds here, the mercurials, um, silver nitrate, formaldehyde, and dyes. So I think you don't need to really worry about those too much at all, but focus on these other characteristics which is what the next part of this PowerPoint will delve into. It'll start talking about first chlorine and iodine-based chemicals. 
So I, I hope that kind of helps answer your question. I think these, again, would be the ones to really be aware of. Um, and this is just another listing. And I sort of asterisked, if that's a word, um, those particular chemicals that I think are worth spending some time on. A lot of these you probably have at home. Many of these are antiseptics, not all, but, but a lot of them. Um, you know, the use of iodine solutions in prepping the skin for surgery. You've probably all seen videos of that, right? Where they use this brownish orange solution on the surface of the skin before they start surgery. That's because iodine, you know, has a very important antiseptic quality to it. It doesn't necessarily kill all the bacteria, but it removes a lot of them. Or sometimes they used to use the term tincture of iodine. Some people used to have that in their medicine cabinets. Um, there's an interesting historical overview of the use of phenol or carbolic acid. And this is um, a series of videos I think it's you know, worth watching that talks about Lister and the role he played, very important role in helping to control infection, mostly post-operative infection, which killed many, many people. As it says here, if you broke your leg in 1842 England, you had a 50% chance of dying from that compound fracture, especially if it was exposed to the atmosphere, you know, the, the outside, any sort of major injury where you broke the skin, um, half, of, half of you died. I mean, it was horrible. So Lister spent some time researching this chemical called carbolic acid or phenol. And he developed this, this uh, mist that he would spray on the patient as he was performing surgery. That's sort of what this sketch is, is kind of trying to depict, although you don't, well, yeah, here's, here's the phenol in this little bottle and it's spraying onto the patient. It's kind of a bizarre way of doing surgery, but what Lister found was the post-operative infection rates were significantly reduced if he used this phenol. It was a very important antimicrobial um, agent. And the problem was it's very caustic to skin and to expose tissue. So it's not without it's not without its downsides. And as the story goes, one of the nurses that assisted Lister in his surgeries, uh, this was prior to the use of, of gowns and masks, as you can see in this photograph, they were they were dressed up in their suit coats and you know, we didn't know anything about the role of microbes are very much about the role of microbes. Lister obviously had some idea of them, but the idea of protecting the patient by covering your mouth or being decked out in a gown or washing your hands beforehand, um, not a lot was known about that yet, the germ theory of disease. Um, but anyway, back to the story. So he's spraying his patient with this thin mist of carbolic and he, one of his assistants, um, one of the nurses, was having a very bad allergic reaction to the phenol it was causing her skin to blister and, you know, uh, bleed. And uh, it was just very, she couldn't hardly work anymore. It was so bad. And he, he really relied on her assistant. Oh, yeah. And didn't he, like, make her gloves and stuff for that? That's and, right. That's right. That's right, Samuel. Yep. Yeah. So he went down to the local hardware store <laughs> or wherever, and he bought some rubber, and he cut the first surgical gloves for his nurse. I can only imagine how difficult it must have, must have been for her to work with these big honking sewn, hand sewn rubber gloves, but her hands weren't obviously um, being impacted by it anymore, so she was protected. And as the story goes, they fell in love, got married. Isn't that an interesting story? Yeah, well, that's the story behind Lister and his, his nurse. But uh, he was he was ahead of his time, you know. He, he really understood that this use of this chemical was helping patients. 
So anyway, that's kind of gets at the anti antiseptic end of carbolic or phenol carbolic acid. So again, I, I think if you go through these these slides, it's they're very straightforward. Um, you know, we can talk about any in particular that you have questions on or difficulty with. Um, it might be worth, you know, having note cards on each one of these chemicals, maybe. Um, you know, however you however you organize your notes. It is a fairly long chapter, as you can see. I got 85 slides. So it's, it's a pretty long chapter. Chapter 12 is likewise a, a pretty long chapter. And as I said, I started that the other day, got through about the first 33 or so slides, but there's I think 90 or so in that chapter too. So do you think because these are long chapters, are we mostly looking at 10 and 11 being on the quiz next week or should we get started on 12 too? Um, I have no problems calling 10 and 11 on the quiz next week. We want to do that. Yeah, that's that's fine with me. In fact, we can make that, that decision right now. I mean, I think you need to be getting into 12 this week at some point, only, only to really adhere to the schedule, because if you don't do that, you get behind and then you're kind of rushing to get caught up. And I know it's hard because you're taking nursing and you're doing other classes and you're working and you've got kids at home. And I mean, I, I know you're busy people. I, I truly do understand that. Um, but I think, I think trying to adhere to the schedule as best you can is to your benefit. But, you know, we're covering a chapter or so a week and that's, that's a lot of stuff, it's a lot of material. So, why don't we make a note right now? I'm going to do this on my syllabus for the April 15th quiz, which is going to be lecture quiz number seven, according to my counting here. We'll have that over. Um, why don't we have that be over chapter 11? We won't. We won't include 10. We'll just do 11. Okay. Everybody give me a thumbs up if you heard me say that. Okay, very good. All right, so quiz next week, chapter 11, physical and chemical agents for microbial control. Any questions on anything you encountered in chapter 10 in the PowerPoint or the video? This is the, the genetic engineering chapter, which I bounced around a little bit in. Any questions? Come on, you must have some questions. Okay. Can we go over how recombinant DNA works? Yes. So let's go to chapter 10. So I'm going to share that. Okay, the whole gist of this chapter really is this idea of being able 
to take genes, desired genes, from organisms and insert them into the genome of other organisms. And these organisms, the one that the gene is being taken from, and the organism that the gene is being inserted into, do not have to be necessarily closely related. Okay. So what they do is they first, they being scientists, we'll, we'll just call them scientists for now. Um, let's pretend you're um, an agronomist. You're, you're involved in agriculture. It's, you, you, know, you work for um, Monsanto or some major um, agriculturally related industry. And you're in charge of coming up with a strain of rice that can be grown in areas that are that is free, that are frequented by drought, let's say. So you're going to try to develop a drought-resistant rice, which might, you know, be um, an amazing thing to provide to countries, you know, um, because the, the the everyday person there, you know, doesn't have access to to rice or adequate staples in their diet, and this could this could really be an important um, and significant benefit to those folks. So what you would have to do is try to, you know, ascertain within a drought resistant plant, what gene provides that drought resistance. Now, I can't speak to how they do that. Um, it's, I'd have to take a bunch of graduate level courses to really be able to accurately and properly explain that process. And it's, it's really beyond the scope of this course. So some things we, 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 we tell you and we put on slides like this, and we don't give you much background information as to how that happens. And so you might have questions and that's perfectly valid to say, well, how do they determine where to get that desired donor gene? And as I said, I can't explain you know, the, the, the process of how that happens. But they do. They somehow are able to detect the gene. And they, they do take um, the, the chromosomes of organisms, and they're able to basically decipher all the various genes. You've heard, have you ever heard of the Human Genome Project? The Human Genome Project was performed, gosh, more than 10 years ago. They've taken all 46 chromosomes and they've mapped out all of the genes. Now they don't know every single gene on every single chromosome, but they're learning about where certain traits are, which gene controls eye color or where certain inherited diseases, what, where that gene is on what chromosome. It's, a lot of work's been done on that. So an important part again is being able to choose the desired gene that you want to, to study or insert in this case into the into the rice plant to make it more drought resistant or more able to survive salty soils. Or maybe you're trying to develop um, a corn plant that has built-in insecticidal activities or um, properties in its in the in the tissue of the plant rather than having to spray that cornfield with a nasty pesticide, I can implant the pesticide gene in the in the corn, and then when the when the corn kernel germinates and plants up and produces a plant with ears of corn, right? Um, that plant will have built-in insecticidal properties. It'll kill insects that are trying to eat the corn flakes. Okay, so identification of the desired gene is kind of critical in this process. And then we've got to, to find a way to insert the gene into the organism. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, one way to do that is to make use of a plasmid. And you hopefully remember what a plasmid is. How would you define plasmid? Anybody? 
what is a plasmid? Uh, plasmid is extra genetic material used in a lot of bacteria, um, usually containing extra DNA to code for something that they can exchange with each other in a pili and stuff. Exactly. It's, it's extra chromosomal DNA, meaning lying outside of the normal circular chromosome that all bacterial cells have. So Samuel's right on the money. It's typically thought of and viewed as a little circular piece of DNA but it is, again, outside of the chromosome. Again, we talked about this back in chapter four. So we find the desired gene, and in this case, we have inserted it in the plasmid. So the blue is the desired gene. Here is the red remaining part of the plasmid. All right, oftentimes the cell that the plasmid is within is a bacterial cell, right? Um, or you can actually also insert plasmids into yeast cells. And what will that cell do in response to having that plasmid? Well, a couple things could happen, and that's what is shown at the bottom of this diagram. One thing that can happen is if this little blue part of the plasmid, the DNA of interest, is the gene that allows for the formation or production of a hormone like insulin, let's say, which you know is necessary for the control of blood glucose in the body, right? Helps keep it lowered. Some people can't produce insulin, so they have to have insulin injected. Well, in the olden days, they used to use pigs as a source of insulin. Now they can take cells like bacteria, insert the insulin instruction booklet, if you will, in the form of this DNA of interest, this gene of interest, and the bacterial cell, when grown in a big fermentation vat or in a big container in the, in, at Monsanto or at um, whatever bio, uh, pharm pharmaceutical company you, you want to work for, they can grow those cells in high abundance. And they can siphon off the insulin that those cells make. The insulin is made because the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA and translated into the insulin protein. And so here we see a, a listing of different examples of pharmaceutical chemicals, some of which are hormones, even some vaccines can be produced um, in this manner. It's pretty amazing. Now, is it easier to grow a cell than it, than it is an organism like a pig? The answer, of course, is yes can better manage, it's much cheaper, it can regulate how many cells are being produced in this vat. It takes pigs years to get old enough to extract the insulin, enough insulin to make it marketable or profitable. So this has revolutionized the industry in terms of lots of pharmaceuticals are made via recombinant DNA technology. This other part of the, of the uh, diagram is referring to how we could take that rice plant and make it more drought resistant or that corn plant and insert herbicidal characteristics into that plant. In other words, rather than having to spray the, the field, the plant will have the built-in herbicide in its tissue or insecticide in its tissue to kill the pests that are trying to kill the plant, the bugs. Only in this case, you've got to insert the plasmid into, this, into the cells of the plant. And then the plant has to be able to make seeds 
that then get planted that result in obviously corn or rice being made. So somehow you got to get it into or transfer it into the gametes. And what do I mean by gametes? If you're a plant, what is the gamete? Well, if you're a human, give me two gametes. You each produce one. Sperm cells are egg and humans. Right, right, obviously, sperm and egg. What if you're a plant? Sperm and egg? Well, no, no sperm and plants. Most plants. Like pollen? Pollen, and right. The pollen is the male gamete, yeah. Um, there are eggs produced by, by female plants. Um, and so if you remember your basic biology from high school, that, that an angiosperm is a flowering plant. And in, in many plants, many flowers, although it depends, you have both male and female parts. Depends on the plant. So some have only male, some have only female flowers. But anyway, um, you've got to incorporate that gene somehow into the gametes so that when the pollen fertilizes the egg and you form a seed, that that seed, which is a dormant embryo basically, um, has the necessary gene or those, those, plant, those cells of the seed have the necessary gene to provide that pest resistance or whatever the case may be. So think about that. That's pretty amazing, being able to manipulate the genetics and incorporate that into a plant and make that plant, again, uh, better able to grow under drought conditions or whatever it is you want to do. The other part of this figure is, is kind of referring to humans, obviously, and the potential for uh, gene therapies. And this has been done now for a number of years where we might use um, a virus of all things. Yes, we're talking about manipulating the genome of the virus, insert the desired gene of interest into the virus. And of course, what's the virus going to do once it comes on the surface of a cell? Well, it ultimately, what do all viruses do? Whether it's by injecting it or moving it in, what gets into the cell? <laughs> ultimately, what, what is the purpose of a virus? It is to parasitize a cell, yes. But what is introduced into the host cell is my question. What, what does most of the dirty work, if you will, for a virus? It's what? What, is it, what does it provide the host cell? Instructions for reproduction. Right, it provides the cell with genetic material, doesn't it? Either RNA or DNA. Isn't that the basic premise of viral biology? Yes, we talked about that in chapter whatever it was. So here's a virus that we're using to our advantage not that we want to get viral infections. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying here we've got a virus that is introducing a gene of interest into a host cell. And we're inserting that gene of interest into the genome such that now the cell might be able to do something that it couldn't do before because it didn't have the proper instruction booklet, if you will, to do that. So we're providing the instruction booklet with the help of the virus. Yeah, maybe that child couldn't produce an important hormone of some sort or you know, growth hormone or insulin or um, any number of different things. Um, and, and so this is, this is gene therapy that we're talking about. And um, so it all really boils down to manipulation of, of genes of desired interest, inserting them into cells Siphoning, siphoning off the desired end product based upon the instruction booklet given to the cells. They make the hormone for us. Or in this case, altering an organism like a plant or maybe inserting a gene into a 
fish so that they can grow faster. You know, the old salmon raised or farm raised salmon, right? A lot of those fish that you buy at Tops or Walmart or wherever, I mean, you can you can spend big money for Alaska raised or Alaska caught salmon. It's very good. It's very expensive, but it's likely that when you go buy salmon steak at the store, you're probably buying farm raised salmon. Sometimes it'll just it'll say right there, you know, what the source is. Well, again, find that slide. It shows you here. Yeah. We insert a gene so that this fish grows twice as fast as the wild salmon does. If it grows twice as fast, I can get it to market faster. If I can get it to market faster, what does that mean for me as, in, as a person who runs the salmon farm? I can make more what? Money. Mula, right. Isn't the goal of life making more moolah? <laughs> now that's a double-edged sword, right? If you think about it. When we put money above other things, we run into problems. But I'm, I'm not going to debate that whole thing. But here's a, a great slide talking about a various number of pharmaceuticals produced. Um, so there, there's just a whole host of benefits that can be gleaned from genetic manipulation and recombination. But, but I'll say from the very beginning, there are lots of people who have concerns about this. I'm not taking a stand either way. I see pros and cons. Um, I philosophically, personally, have an issue with manipulating the genomes of organisms. Now, if that meant you could save my daughter who's, who's going to die from a particular rare mutation that she got as, you know, as an infant, I would probably change my tune maybe. So I, got, I can't be too judgmental, but I get worried when we start manipulating the genomes of lots of animals because we just, we wanna make fish grow faster or maybe it's more altruistic. We wanna be able to, to lessen the, the, the famine issues in Africa because we can now grow plants that are again, able to grow in those particular conditions. So it, it is just a very slippery slope and it's there's some real good things that have come from this too. So I don't know, have you thought about this very much? Many people haven't, I think. But the reality is when you look at present day agriculture, and the amount of corn that's grown in the Midwest or even here in the East, the vast majority of, of corn, I'm not talking sweet corn here, I'm talking about you know, corn, cow corn, um, it's, it's genetically modified corn. You could be a farmer in Iowa and you might say, I'm philosophically opposed to using genetically modified corn. I just don't believe in it. I think it's, there's some concerns about it. I wanna use conventional corn i.e. non-genetically modified. Guess what? I have no choice. If I want to grow corn in my farm, I have to buy GMO. I, I, I cannot get my hands on any other types of corn. And so this gets back to, again, a, another whole discussion and debate, perhaps some would say, that some companies um, have, have monopolized this. They, they, they control what corn is sent and provided to farmers. Farmers are, they have no say in the matter. If you want to make a livelihood as a farmer, you got to buy this corn and there's only, you can only get it from like two companies. And they're probably both owned by the same conglomerate. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's a lot of politics here and that it, it kind of spills over into science a little bit as well. And again, I, I kind of on the fence. I feel two ways about that. Other questions?
don't get all caught up in the uh, the nitty gritty of the process like this um, slide kind of goes into some some pretty detailed explanation of how this gene is is inserted into the into the plasmid um, or it, it's yeah it's coming from a particular cell then inserted into the plasmid and then it gets incorporated into the cell um, i like to you know just the the basic the basic process don't get all caught up in the in the nitty-gritty steps here get a get a sense for the overall picture of what's going on here so transgenic plants, transgenic animals, these are animals, plants that have had their genomes altered. Has anybody gotten into chapter 10 yet? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you finding it a difficult chapter to plow through, or are you okay with it? Or um, as I read through it, yeah, I kind of have to stop from time to time and just um, think. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the book is much more complicated than how you explained it in your slides. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Well, that was my goal because I I'll be honest with you. I, as I said earlier, I don't know everything there is to know about the technology. And I feel, I feel very, um, how should I put it, inadequate in terms of being able to explain it well because I don't understand all of it. So what I want you to get out of the chapter is a basic understanding of, of what's happening, basically. That's, that's kind of my hope. Without you getting all frustrated by the technicalities, both in terms of, of procedures and mechanisms because this is this goes well beyond really what I think we need to know. So if you follow the PowerPoint and it sounds to me like I kind of laid it out somewhat logically um, and you're getting the basic gist of what um, you know bioengineering provides that's that's my my goal. Yeah, I decided to read the chapter before I looked at the PowerPoint <laughs> and it made my head spin. I kind of wish I would have looked at the PowerPoint first. Oh, I know it. I know it. It's oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's and I applaud you, Stephanie, big time for doing that. I do um, because sometimes you did the same thing. Oh, okay. That can be helpful. That can be helpful sometimes. The downside is you don't know exactly what slides or topics I might omit from the chapter, and this is a case in point where, boy, a good half of it I didn't even put in. Um. If nothing else, it gave you an, it gives you an appreciation of the amazing science that that is going on that we've learned about. It's it's just mind-boggling to me uh, what we can do. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I would say follow the PowerPoint, find those sections in the book that correspond to those topics. And, and proceed to the chapter in that way. That's that's going to be, I think, uh, a good way to go. Um, other topics, questions? Can you explain the CRISPR technology? Is that something we're going to need to know? <laughs> you don't need to know that. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. That's probably in here too. I'm trying to remember what page that is. 323. Um, I'm sorry? It's on 323. 323, right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, again, this 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 goes beyond I think what we need to worry about. So no, you don't need to know that.
really to understand this chapter well, you need to take a molecular biology course. I think I think our book is is great. I think it goes into a lot of detail, though, that the average student, at least for this course, um, I think is is going overboard in terms of what we need. Anything else you want to talk about? Well, definitely get into chapter 10 if you haven't done that. Start 11, get into 11. Um, and ideally, by, by this weekend, Try to get into a little bit of 12, if at all possible, so that you're kind of back on schedule. Um, I will tell you, as I said earlier, um, chapter 12 is a long chapter. It's not, yeah, it's just, it's full of different kinds of drugs and how they target microbes. It's, it's interesting, fascinating stuff. But there's a there's a lot of vocabulary there, so that's a fairly long chapter. Thirteen is also um, a fairly long chapter, and then the last two chapters, fourteen and fifteen, I believe it is. Yeah, um, fourteen is on um, introduction to host defenses and innate immunities. If you think back to A and P one, at least if in my class, um, these are the lymphatics chapter is the last chapter we cover. So we're going to be taking time in micro to to cover, in essence, what the lymphatic system covered in A and P. Only we're going to be going in a little more detail. But um, fourteen and fifteen get into some um, technicalities here a little bit too as, as it relates to the immune response and, and that's uh, that's kind of where we wrap up the course basically. So in essence, we have about uh, I guess four more chapters really to do and then we're then we're done once we get beyond uh, 11 12, 13, 14 and 15. All right. Uh, well, I'll be in my Zoom room here until uh, 2.30 before micro lab starts. So if there's no questions. I will see you next Tuesday. <laughs>